we'll make a couple quick in, couple of quick introductions here, and then we'll get started. Um, so I'm Jeff Couch. I'm the one that's been working with Beth and just barely recently with Joe um, to, to provide you all with the Pocket Labs. Um, and, uh, and then we brought on um, Jason here, who's our training and support manager, and, and, uh, and then we'll be conducting the training today. And then we'll be doing one um, early Saturday morning. And I believe that's with Robbie, if I'm not mistaken, um, who's our product manager. Um, but, uh, but we'll be here, um, like I said, a couple of you um, joined after I said it, but I will be, I'll be hopping off, but getting on a phone call. I got to go get my kids from school, but Jason will be conducting this training today. And, uh, but you all should have my contact information. If you don't, you can get it from Beth. If there's any questions post this training that you want to reach out about, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here to help in any way possible. I want to make sure STEM week is a success and then moving on using pocket lab in your classroom is a success throughout the entire school year. So there's nothing I, I dislike more than selling a product to a school and teachers not knowing how to use it and they never use it. So I want to make sure that you're set up for success uh, throughout the school year and into the future. So I'll, I'll be quiet now and hand it over to Jason. And then, and also we have Christina Mitchell who's just joined the team yesterday. So she's here observing and uh, super excited to have her. She comes from a long education background and lives out in California. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jason. Cool, yeah, thanks Jeff. Um, yes, I'm Jason. I'm our uh, support manager here at Pocket Lab. Um, so actually a question for you all. I know you all are kind of different grades like K through 12, essentially. Um, do you all have Pocket Labs with you? Or are you gonna follow along or do you just want me to show you? I don't have one. Okay. I don't yeah, we have don't, one. Either. We don't yeah, have they them shouldn't have them yet. Yeah, yeah PO gotcha. was okay. just placed last week. So they, they'll be getting them. You should all be getting them fairly soon um, cool. in the next week or so, I'd assume, or at least arriving there. Okay, great. Yeah, so I can show you. Uh, uh, and then you guys have the you have Airs, Voyagers, and Thermos, right? Cool. Yeah, right, I so think I'll that's show right. you all of those. Awesome. Kind of how to get connected, how a notebook works, um, and kind of how you can collect data, like in the field or in the classroom. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, can you all see this okay? Cool, see a thumbs up. Uh, so this is notebook, uh, what it looks like on a computer. So you can connect here uh, in Google Chrome, so you don't have to download anything on Windows or uh, Macs or Chromebooks. Um, then for Android devices, there's an app that looks just like this. Um, for iOS, we have a little bit different app, but you can find that on the App Store. Both of those apps are going to be called uh, the Pocket Lab app. Um, so you guys can find all of those for when you're recording on your phones. Uh, but the best way to use notebook is probably on a computer, just everything's a little bit bigger, easy to read, uh, and all of that. Um, so you all can make an account for free, or the Notebook Pro just has a little bit additional features. I'm not sure if you all have that included in your package, but that's an option there. But for collecting data and kind of everything else you need to do, um, you can use a free account. So we're going to start out on the trials page, which is just the quickest way to get connected and collect some data. Um, the first one I'll show you is this orange one here. So this is the Voyager. Uh, this one kind of shows, uh, kind of has the most thing, things to show. Uh, so all of our sensors are just going to have one button on them. This is going to turn them on and start advertising to Bluetooth. Um, they're all going to connect to, to Bluetooth. So you can just click Connect to Pocket Lab. It'll show up in this connection window. And you can click Pair. And this will take just a second to get connected. Cool. So now this is uh, streaming acceleration data in real time. So if I shake this around, you can see that acceleration change on the graph. So this is graphing in uh, all three dimensions. So the blue is our Y axis, so up and down. And then red is the X axis, so side to side. And then green is our Z axis, that's gonna be forward and back. So you kind of see those on the, on the graph change as I move this around. We have some options here to change like what is displayed. So if we only want to see acceleration on the y-axis, we can turn the other ones off. See that a little clearer. Uh, we can change the units. So right now it's in meters per second. Uh, we can change that to Gs. 
And then we have some other visualizations here. So if you want to see the like instantaneous acceleration as a bar graph, that's an option. But generally, the line graph is a little better. We can change the data rate that we're recording at. So by default, it's going to be 10 points per second, which is good for most, most cases. But you can turn it all the way up to 50 points per second. If maybe you're putting this on a car and want to see a collision that happens in like a fraction of a second, you can see that here. You need a lot cleaner data. Or if you're recording something that's uh, a lot slower or over time, if you want to record for several hours, you can turn the data rate all the way down to like one point per minute. Maybe not as relevant for acceleration, but for some of the other settings, uh, it's going to be helpful. And uh, kind of in general, your battery will last around eight hours at the default data rate, but then slowing down the data rate, your battery can last a little longer if you're recording continuously. Uh, most teachers will just you know plug these in overnight and then your voyages will be good for like a full day of classes. Uh, as far as other graphs, so the Voyager can measure all of these things here. Um, I can go through these kind of quickly, but if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to just jump in and ask. So we can also measure uh, scalar acceleration. So this is just taking the magnitude of those acceleration graphs. I'm not sure there's a link that I've gone. And as you can see, you can graph multiple graphs at the same time if you want, kind of compare things. Uh, we also have angular velocity. So this is going to be uh, the rotation of the device. So it's also going to be in all three dimensions. So we can rotate it this way. Let's see uh, angular velocity around the z axis, forward and back. To see angular velocity around the x axis. And then this way to see ang angular velocity around the y axis. So you can mount this uh, on like a wheel and see how fast it's spinning um, or just any, any kind of rotation like that. Uh, we also have magnetic field. So uh, this is going to be the magnetic field strength, again, in all three axes. So if I turn this around, change the orientation, the magnetic field changes. We also have magnetic field magnitude, which is just uh, yeah, the magnitude of the magnetic field. So it's a little easier to conceptualize. Um, there's an option to zero this out. Right now, it's probably picking up the magnetic field off of like my computer and other things in the, in the room. So if I take this little like donut magnet, if I move this closer, I see the magnetic field increase. And as I move away, it decreases. Uh, we can also measure air pressure. Um, so this is going to be yeah, the air pressure in the room. And a good demo for this one is I can put this in a plastic bag that's full of air and seal it up. And if I move this out of the way. So if I squeeze this, the air pressure in the bag is going to increase, and we can see the graph go up as well. This is a really good way to kind of visualize something that's otherwise hard for students to see. You can really see this air pressure change in the bag when the volume of the bag changes. Uh, we can also measure altitude. So this is the altitude based on air pressure. So if you want to like attach this to a rocket and shoot it up in the air, you can see the altitude change. Uh, this is another one that you can zero out. So I can zero it out at like the height of my desk. Uh, this one does bounce around a little bit, kind of as small changes in air pressure are measured by the device. But then if I raise this up, it'll start bouncing around a little bit higher. Uh, and then as far as like actually shooting this up in a rocket, um, these are pretty durable. So we've launched these uh, a couple hundred feet in the air and have them come down and land on grass and the sensor's fine. Uh, but I guess one thing is they're not waterproof, so we need to keep them from getting wet. Uh, it also has an internal temperature sensor. So this is just the temperature in the room. This is uh, it's running a little bit hot right now because I was charging it right before this. So since the battery is still a little hot inside the device, it's picking that up. You can also measure humidity. So if I like breathe on the device, see a big spike in humidity. Uh, so one, one cool lesson that we have, uh, so we have a bunch of pre-made lessons that in our lesson library that I'll show a little bit later, but one of them is uh, looking at the eff efficacy of face masks. So breathing on the humidity sensor through different face masks and seeing okay, how much of that breath humidity makes it through a cloth mask versus a surgical mask versus an N95 mask. And we were really able to see that uh, 
even just cloth masks stop a lot of that humidity, a lot of the moisture in your breath from coming out into the air. Uh, but then better masks like N95 masks stop pretty much all of the humidity from being released. So they do a lot better job of keeping just anything from coming out of your body. Uh, it also measures dew point and heat index. So these are kind of composite measurements of how hot does it feel or like what temperature does, is moisture gonna become like rain? Uh, so that's gonna be based on the temperature and the humidity. And that's just calculated inside the device. Another measurement is light intensity. So how bright is the light that's going into the front of the device? So if I cover this up, I'll drop down to zero. Uh, right now, those little spikes in the graph is actually from the, the LED light that's flashing. Uh, right now, it's telling me my battery is low, so it's picking up <laughs> the light flashing inside the device. Uh, generally, once the when the device is like fully charged, you won't see these little spikes. Then if I, I point this towards the window, I'll see the light intensity go up as it's picking up more light. Uh, if I move it back, light intensity will go down. It also has an external temperature probe, uh, which is not plugged in right now, which is what it's reading. Here, so this is, comes in, comes with your device. There's a little port on the side. You can plug this in. So then this probe is uh, waterproof and safe in like acids and bases. So you can use this to measure the temperature of liquids or uh, it can also be used to measure air temperature. Uh, it's a little more accurate than the internal uh, air temperature sensor. Uh, this one will respond to change a lot quicker just because it's using this probe. Uh, so I have some ice water here. I can place this into the water and see that temperature dropping really quickly. Um, I guess one thing you can kind of see here is um, like the negative exponential rate of cooling from the temperature probe. Let's take this back out. And it'll adjust back up to room temperature. Um, ADC, uh, we don't really use for much. This is the, like the raw measurement that's coming from the temperature probe, um, kind of before it's converted to temperature. Uh, tactile pressure is uh, another external temperature, uh, another external attachment that we have. Um, it measures kind of how hard you're pressing down on this little pad. Uh, I don't have one here with me right now. And then range finder. This is going to shine a little infrared light out of the front of the device, and then it measures how long it takes for the light to come back. So I can see like how far away am I from the desk, and if I move this closer, I see that distance increasing, uh, increasing. So this you can see uh, kind of change in position. So like a good intro activity that we have for students is just visualizing um, changes like on graphs, so students can like hold this on their chest and walk towards and farther away from like a wall and they can see how their position is changing and how that relates to this graph and then maybe if they move faster the position will change a lot faster or slower then for when you're ready to record a trial so i'll just uh, maybe i want to see how does magnetic field vary with distance so I'll zero out this magnetic field, with my range finder pointing down. I'll take this little magnet and put it right under and click record. And I'll slowly move the pocket lab down towards the magnet. Okay, stop. So now we have all this data recorded. So you can see kind of as we move closer to the magnet, this magnetic field increased. Uh, if we want to review our data a little more closely, we can click to zoom in on the graph. So I can zoom all the way in at this like these final points and then hover over them. And down here, you'll see uh, the magnetic field strength. Or, and then right here, you'll see the distance. So as this distance approached zero, the magnetic field approached uh, these values down on the bottom. Uh, so yeah, you can click and drag to zoom in and double click to zoom back out. Um, some other data analysis that's built in. You can open up this tab, you can see uh, average values. So if I wanted to zoom in on this uh, final reading here, then I can see the average magnetic field values here. Uh, we can also zoom in on this one, do things like curve fitting. Uh, so if I wanted to 
by like an exponential curve fit to this uh, range finder graph or to this these magnetic field graphs. You can do that and you can see this uh, line of that best fit equation. Uh, so maybe if you're doing change in position, you could find you know the slope of the line that was created by the positioning graph or other things like that. And if you want to save your data, uh, you, there's a couple options. You can save it right to your notebook account if you're signed in or if your students are signed in by just clicking save. Uh, if you click the little arrow, there's some other options. You can download a CSV file of your data then open it up in Google Sheets or Excel and do analysis that way. Uh, you can upload it to a Google Drive. So if you want to, you know, maybe you're saving data on your phone and you want to open it up later on a computer, you can just do that easily. Or you can save these to uh, what we call a lab report. Um, so these are kind of like a virtual lab notebook where students can record data and answer questions and upload images or watch videos. And I'll show that a little bit after this. Uh, so that's kind of your data. If you don't want to save this to your account, you can just click clear. Um, some other options here. Uh, you can rename your devices. That's kind of only a feature on the Voyagers, but if you have like a lot of students who are connecting in the same room, or a lot of Voyagers in the same room, it can be easier to rename them just so like group one, group two. So it's a little easier for them to figure out which is theirs. Uh, you can also record in memory mode. Uh, so you can start the device recording, disconnect from Bluetooth, maybe take it like outside or out on the hike or anything that's going to go out of Bluetooth range. And then all that data will be saved into the onboard memory, and then you can download it later. Uh, so that is kind of all the things with Voyager. Is there any questions there? I know you're going to um, do some lessons, look at, show us some lessons. Um, yeah. But I was just wondering, just for like, I deal with the early childhood age group, so K to two. So like, what, what could we do with this pocket lab with that age group? I guess it's yeah, um, it could be a really good intro into you know like how how could we how do we analyze data? So maybe things like light intensity, they can see um, you know like what like what changes on the graph when we turn the lights on and off, and then students can try to make that connection to what is the what does the graph look like when it's bright versus when it's completely dark, or um, things with temperature. So maybe students can feel the difference between uh, two different temperatures, and then they can visualize that on a temperature graph and then kind of see like oh this represents a high temperature versus uh, this is a low temperature. Uh, if, uh, if graphs are a little too complicated there's also just the instantaneous readings. Uh, so this is just the acceleration like out of time maybe I'll do something like light intensity or even temperature might be the easiest to understand. But if you yeah, don't want to show the graph changing over time, you can just show like, this is the temperature right now. And then you can measure just this as it changes. So measure in a hot room versus measuring outside, maybe where it's colder. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. Any other questions? Cool. Um, something in the chat. Oh yeah, uh, thanks, Christina. Yeah, she puts the hazard uh, pocket lab like on race cars, and you can see uh, how fast the car is going, and then how how quickly it slows down, crashes into stuff. Uh, one one lesson we have is like a crash cushion investigation. So, uh, seeing the acceleration of when a little car hits a wall, and then how can you make something that's going to reduce the force of that impact? Uh, so next up, I'll show the pocket lab air. So this big green one. On. So same way, just a button on top, that'll start the LED light flashing, connect, so, so, no, Voyager, there. Uh, so one thing, if you do have two that are in the same room, if I move Voyager a little bit farther away and my air a little closer, well, I guess they're both still a little bit too close, only a few feet apart, uh, you can use this um, Bluetooth connection signal strength indicator to see which is uh, which is the closest to your computer. So they're not showing kind of what we want to see. So the Pocket Lab Air is right close by, Pocket Lab Voyager is a little farther away. So I can tell that this is the one that I want to connect to. Um, so if there's were both Voyagers, you can see which is which is the closest. 
So just like pair. So the uh, pair by default is going to show kind of all of the measurements that it can record. Uh, so it's measuring particulate matter, um, so like small particles that are in the air. So things like burning a candle can spike the particulate matter or like frying bacon or picking up vehicle exhaust, all of those will spike the particulate matter. Uh, carbon dioxide would be any the CO2 concentration in the room. Um, generally, you want to, so outside air is roughly like 400 uh, parts per million. Um, good indoor air is around maybe 700. So this is telling me maybe I want to open a window and get some fresh air in here because I've been inside a little too long. Uh, you also have ozone. Um, this graph kind of can bounce around a little bit uh, as it adjusts. Uh, I guess for all of these sensors, it does take a few minutes to adjust to the ambient air uh, kind of readings. So giving these a while to kind of level out is usually a good idea. And then uh, air quality index is uh, taking just kind of measurements from mostly particulate matter and carbon dioxide and using that to calculate air quality. So even though my CO2 is a little bit high in here, my air quality index is still good inside. So like a few weeks back, there were a lot of fires in uh, California and Oregon. So the air quality index was a lot worse, mostly from this particulate matter being a lot higher. But this is a definitely a cool thing to do out in the field so you can take your pocket of air out and measure air quality index in different parts of town or just even different parts times a day. Uh, like maybe when, you know, in the morning, right when all the kids are being dropped off at school, you can see this particulate matter change from all of the exhaust out in the parking lot from all the cars. And then some other measurements. Uh, it also measures light intensity, uh, humidity, internal temperature and pressure, uh, just like the Voyager does. Uh, so you can see all of those as well. Um, we also have a like public air quality index map. So this is taking public air quality data from various measurement, measurement stations um, around the area. So I'm here in San Francisco. So this is showing air quality around me. So you can see kind of how data you're collecting is related to maybe other places around you. Um, oh, another cool thing that I don't think I showed for Voyager. If you want to record some data, Maybe out in the field recording some air quality data. I'll just do it for a little bit. Uh, you can view this data on a map. Um, I think this is a feature for, it's not for every measurement, but just kind of the ones that would make sense to collect out in the field. So I can see, uh, like, this is the particulate matter reading taken from this location. Um, it's kind of a rough estimate. My, uh, since this is taking, it takes the GPS data from your computer. So this can kind of be less accurate than if you're recording on like a cell phone. Um, those usually have a little more accurate GPS data, but you can so go and record in different parts of town. And then you can see uh, on a map like where you recorded and then what was the particulate matter reading there in the time. Um, and if you save your data to a CSV file, the, that location data can be saved in there as well. Um, that is something that you have to turn on, so it'll prompt you, like, do you want Pocket Lab to have access to your location data? You can say yes or no. Uh, so those are all of the measurements for uh, Pocket Lab Air. Let's see. Any questions about Pocket Lab Air or these kind of location stuff? Oh. So I'll just unpair there. And then last one, so Pocket Lab Thermo uh, looks a little different, just like a little circuit board. Uh, it comes with this little protective case uh, that just screws onto the top. And it has two temperature probes. So you can uh, like compare maybe like one chemistry experiment, experiment to a control or compare two different chemistry things uh, or two different temperatures. So it's going to have a red and a blue probe. Uh, generally, we use the red one for hot, blue for cold, but you can use whichever for uh, for whatever you want. And same thing, just has one button for us to start advertising to Bluetooth. The light will come on, click connect. And then we can see Pocket Lab Thermo is going to show up here. Turn off my other Pocket Lab. 
So we can see this temperature probe data streaming in real time. So then maybe if I take my ice water back and put the balloon probe in the water, we can see the temperature of the blue probe uh, changing rapidly compared to the room temperature red probe. Yeah, so yeah, thermos are yeah, a lot more simple, but lets you just compare two temperatures in real time. Uh, again, you can change the units. Uh, if you want to turn one of the probes off, you can. If you want to measure in Celsius or Kelvin, and you can change the data rate as well. It's one thing to note, the thermo uses just a little button cell battery. So um, they do last for, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but several hundred hours of continuous recording. Um, it's pretty, the circuit board's pretty light. Uh, but then all of our other devices, so the Air and the Voyager are gonna be USB rechargeable. So they just they just plug in to, your, to uh, an outlet or to a USB and they charge that way. That is the thermo. Yeah, so all the devices, um, pretty easy to get connected. You just go to the trials page, click connect to Pocket Lab, turn them on with that one button, and then you're good to go. Um, some other things here, you can also use your internal device sensors. So uh, this is going to be the things that your laptop has built in. So right now, this is just audio levels. So as I'm talking, this kind of jumps around or like. A snap and get a little bigger spike. Uh, it counts, my laptop also has an internal accelerometer, so you can do it that way. So even if students don't have a pocket lab, they can maybe connect to their phones and then use their phones like built in accelerometer to still collect some data. There's that. Another option is Velocity Lab. So if you use your with Pocket Lab Voyager, if you attach this to a wheel of a cart or even something just like a can or anything that rolls, you can battery die. So you can connect to like the wheel of the device and put in the dimensions of the wheel, and then as the Voyager spins on the wheel. Um, you can see the it'll using the the diameter of the wheel. It'll measure the position, the velocity, and the acceleration of that wheel. So you can see how all three of those graphs change. So you go through this um, little menu, input the data of uh, what what axis it's spinning around. So the z axis. Let's put one inch here. No years. And, oh, unfortunately, the battery on my Voyager is has just died. I'm going to let that charge for a little bit. I can come back to this if we have time at the end. But basically, this will let you see that position, velocity, and acceleration change over time on a spinning wheel. Uh, so that's everything on this uh, on the trials page. I guess down here, this is where your measurements will save if you click to save them to your notebook account. Um, so here's some data I recorded a while back, just of some air quality readings. Uh, you can label these, uh, you can add notes. Um, you can also uh, save these into a new lab report or download the CSV file later. All right, so now I'll show our lesson library. So this is where you can find a lot of our pre-built activities, um, either made by us in-house or from some of our curriculum partners. Uh, so you can sort these by subjects, so physical, earth, or life science, uh, by what sensor they use, uh, by grade level, or um, by channel, which are just kind of our broad groups. Um, so we have lessons that use FET simulations. Um, show, I'll show a lesson that just kind of has a little bit of everything. So these are all of our NGSS middle school aligned content, uh, mostly physical science, but we're um, adding some uh, bio ones as well. And then we're planning on adding earth science uh, after that. 
So this one is investigating the energy of a pendulum. So it's looking at what variables affect the energy of a pendulum and how can we measure those changes. So this is a lab report. So there can be these text cards, there can be uh, GIFs showing things. Uh, this is the setup for, for this investigation. So just putting the pocket lab on a piece of tape and then showing the harmonic motion as it swings back and forth. And then in this lesson, uh, students can use a spec simulation to kind of see how a pendulum performs in maybe ideal scenarios. So this is like fully interactive, just like that always is. Uh, so students can interact with this right here and see how these factors change the swing of the pendulum. Uh, they can answer some questions here. They can uh, work on these graphs. And then they can kind of verify what they see in the simulation using a pocket lab. Um, so if you want to use this lesson in your class, you can click add to your notebook. And then you get a fully editable version of this lab. So if you want to make any changes or just use our lessons as a starting point, you can import them. And then you can change this around. So if I want to change the investigation question or add some more background info, you can do that. Some other options, you can upload images, you can add YouTube videos. Uh, you can add bar graphs, scatter plots, data tables, or maps where you can add waypoints. Um, question cards, uh, so free response for multiple choice. Uh, you can add a Google Drive file and then, or a FET simulation. Uh, so once you have this lesson that you're ready to use in your classroom, uh, you can do that uh, right here if you have your classes set up or from the classes page. And everything runs a little bit slower while I'm sharing my screen in a Zoom call, but usually it loads a little faster. Uh, so here you can create classes. Um, you can add, you can import classes from Google Classroom uh, and just import your rosters that way. Uh, I'll go into this demo class and show you all how to create some student accounts. So to add students, uh, you can just add student names um, here on a new line. So I'll add myself, Jason, and then maybe Janet, and Suk, and I'll add Joe. Um, we can just copy and paste them all in here, and then this will create some student accounts. So then students can sign in just with this class code here, and then by entering their name. Uh, so I'll just copy this. To move all these Zoom controls out of the way. There we go. So then for students, when they come here, uh, they can just click here, enter their class code, and type their name. And then this is going to be the student version of a notebook. Um, oh, it looks like I forgot to assign that lesson to the student. I'll go back. There we go. Oh, it didn't like me canceling out of that to get this on there. There we go. Okay. I had to remember which account I was signed into. I have a whole bunch here. Go back into this class. And I'll sign that lesson that we just imported. So investigating the energy of a pendulum. So you can sign this to students individually or to them as in lab groups. Uh, when they're in groups together, they can all work in the same assignment, uh, kind of like Google Docs. So they'll see each other's changes or data um, added in real time. I'll just put all of us in a group together. Um, and then these lab groups will be remembered for any other assignments you make in the future. Uh, so down here is kind of a little progress bar. You can see as students like mark stuff off as completed or add their own sections, it'll show up down there. Now I'll go back in and show what it looks like as a student now that we have something there to see. So here's that lesson. So this is the student version of the lab report. 
uh, so they can mark these text sections as complete as they go through. They can add their own text cards if they want to like write up something a little more significant, or they can add answers here that'll show up with their name on it. Um, down here, students can connect their pocket labs right into this lab report. Turn one on. Print an error. So then in here, students can collect data uh, right in this lab report. So they can click record, record some data, and stop. And then this trial is going to be saved uh, right into this lab report with their name on it. So students can title their trials. Um, so maybe trial one. Uh, they can add notes saying what they tested here, maybe what their observations are. And then uh, once students have completed the assignment, they can go up and turn this in so it'll timestamp it and make it so it's no longer editable by the students. And if we go back to the teacher, so go back into this class, you can see the student marked uh, two sections as complete and they added a trial down here. We can go in and as the teacher, we can uh, kind of review the student's work. We can add comments, um, giving them feedback. We can add extra sections to the student's lab report. So if one group needs a little bit more help, maybe you can add something there, or if you want to add an extension for some people who finished early, that's an option. Um, and after giving feedback, you can return this back to students so they can fix their mistakes or work on it a little bit more. So that's kind of how these lab reports and the classes work in the book. Is there uh, any questions about all of that stuff? Do you need to have a class assigned for them to collect data? Like, could they just use the trials without having a class assigned? Yeah, so for on the trials page, you don't even have to be logged in. You can just go uh, right here and collect some data. Um, uh, students on the student account, they'll have a trials page too, so they can collect data there. Uh, students can also just make their own lab reports without you assigning anything to them. So they could just save their data uh, in a lab report if they want to format it that way. Yeah, yes, yeah, so they don't. And you don't even have to create student accounts. If you want them to just go to the trials page and collect data, they can do that. Yeah, so here uh, as a student, I can create a lab report. And then I have these sections that I can add. So I could add a text section and maybe explain what I did in my procedure. I could add a spot for me to collect, uh, collect some data, connect my pocket lab and save some trials in here. Cool. Any other questions? And is what you're showing us right now, this is all like the free version or is this the like upgraded version? Yes, this is all uh, the free version. So the we're making a switch. Uh, actually, maybe this already went through in the last week or next week. Um, basically, the pro version, uh, the difference between the free version, and the pro version, the free version just has a limited number of assignments that you can push out to your students. So I think it's going to be 10 assignments. Um, so in the free version, you do have the option of just deleting old assignments um, and then assigning new ones to students. But if you just want to have all of that student data saved in Notebook forever. That's what the, the paid version is for. But yeah, you can always uh, view stuff on the resources page. You can uh, connect and collect data. Yeah, all in the free version. Cool. Any other questions? Um, some other stuff I can show. I guess when you land here on the home page, there's some getting started guides um, for all the sensors that kind of show you um, some example lessons and just kind of reiterate some of the stuff I talked about here. So getting connected and how to use lab reports and all of that stuff. Um, in the lesson library, we have um, some tutorial resources uh, down at the bottom. So 
So uh, we have like an introduction lab report for students to use, um, and then just how to do all the things within Notebook. Uh, so I definitely encourage you all to go check out this uh, this lesson library on all of our resources and then kind of see all the stuff that we have here, some more example lessons. Uh, these are some ones that we added recently with kind of a new feature. So we have this global project map where uh, teachers can add waypoints to this and it'll be seen by all the other teachers who have been added. Uh, so we just launched this recently. Uh, so we have some data that's collected in San Jose. Uh, this one is investigating heat islands, so measuring temperature in uh, like green spaces compared to uh, places with um, you know just pavement concrete. Uh, so some data just taken on a street here. And our hope is that a lot of teachers are going to add this to their lessons and then go in here and start filling out this map with a lot of heat island data. So. Uh, we can kind of see and teachers can compare their data to other teachers and stuff like that. And then, yeah, this one has some directions kind of about standardizing the data that's been added, but yeah. All right, any other questions? And these uh, lessons can be sorted by grade level? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we can look at K through five, okay. um, six through eight. Most of our content is uh, middle school, kind of high school level, but we do have mm -hmm. K through five stuff as well. Um, so other lessons. Uh, we have all of these FET lessons that just use the simulations, and most of these don't use a pocket lab. Um, then we have, uh, this is a series we added recently where we uh, interviewed like scientists or engineers and had them talk about how their work relates to uh, stuff they learned in school and specifically like NGSS uh, standards. So kind of wanted to answer the question that students always ask, like, why are we learning this? Like this is, these are some real people in the real world who are applying concepts that they learned in middle school and high school. So all of these are just, uh, just like a short, like five to seven minute video, and then just some questions. So just some quick little assignments. But yeah, I think that's just about everything I had to show you all today. I know you mentioned there are three different types of pocket labs, the Voyager, the air, and the thermo, thermal or thermo. Yeah. yeah that's so right. And I believe Jason mentioned at the beginning that um, we'll be getting one of these pocket labs. Which one will we be getting? And was that correct? First off, and if so, which one will we be getting? Yeah, so I can answer that as well as just a couple other STEM week related things. I'll stick, I'm going to stick a link in the chat in just a minute. Um, that is it's just a Google form and you essentially just sign up for what you want. Um, and we're working on distributing. Likely what we're going to do is post up at um, uh, the Campbell Resource Center in Dorchester and maybe other location um, a few days, uh, the week or two before STEM week. And then you can just come pick up um, what you signed up for. Um, you will definitely have access to the air and the Thurbo. The Voyager is like on back order and we're either going to get it like right in time or just miss it. So uh, we'll see, but again, like once we get um, once we get the the Voyagers in, we'll also communicate that. So again, it's not like you know we do STEM week and then you can't have these anymore. These will be available for you to you know borrow and lend out uh, at your leisure. Um, the other thing I just quickly wanted to mention was that. Um, on October 23rd, uh, we're having our student showcase. So all the projects that students uh, will have been working on uh, over the course of the week, uh, we're inviting those who would be interested to come to the zoo um, and do kind of like a science fair type of deal where they, they can um, talk to folks about what they worked on and sort of the changes that they wanna make to their community um, based on what they did. 
We'll be inviting city officials uh, as well as other VIPs to come talk to the students and also hoping that they can advocate for change in their community based on what they've been working on during the week. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, it's also going to be free um, to BPS families to go to the zoo on that day, whether they have a, a child presenting or not. Um, and all of that can be found in the calendar um, link that I sent a little bit earlier. And so let me just also stick, um, and let me know if this link doesn't work, but you can just sign up for what you want using that form I just put in the chat. All right. Well, I think that's everything for me. If you all have any questions about using Pocket Labs or uh, anything else like that, you can reach out to me at uh, support at thepocketlabs.com. Um, that'll just get straight to me. Or uh, any other questions, you can, kind of, you can keep talking to uh, Jeff as well. Uh, but yeah, thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate it.